Okay, yeah, so so class, welcome back students. Um, I wanna just thank uh, Valerie Wood for letting me teach this extraordinary chapter over the last couple of months. Um, this is, will technically be our last class for what's called literature and theory of classical architecture. We're gonna be focusing on the contemporary built environment, mostly classical architecture at a larger, if not urban scale. <laughs> We're going to be, excuse me, looking at several different architects. Um, we're going to be looking at classical architects that began as a reaction to postmodern architecture, <clears throat> which of course is considered what's called new classism. Really three prominent, well-known, world-renowned architects. There are many classical architects over the United States that have small, large firms, but these are really three people that have kind of put themselves on the map. Alan Greenberg, Robert Stern, and of course, Quinlan Terry. You know, Quinlan Terry is really purely classified. I don't think he <clears throat> really, I think he kind of just avoided the postmodern phase altogether, thank God. He, he technically was the Royal Philomene's architect. Um, they're gonna look at two really urban architects, Cotter and Kim and Michael Dennis. And then at the end of the lecture, I'll give you, show you some examples of what we're gonna be drawing uh, starting the first week of June. So really these three architects, Alan Greenberg, Stern, and Quinlan Terry. I'm um, just kind of, just kind of a, a refresher, you know, I know it's been a long time since we actually looked at, you know, the proper scale and proportion of classical orders. Um, what I'm showing you is, is I think by now in the class, you can see that classical architectures, particularly the orders are designed based on drawing and calculations, not based on observation and, you know, Googling stuff on the internet and just plopping, copying, pasting a portico on front of a building. It's definitely more sophisticated than that. You know, and again, when I'm, kind of regurgitating is the fact that, you know, pretty much everything is based on the diameter of the column. If you've kind of forgotten that, it's really an important rule to listen, to, excuse me, to remember. Um, so the American Vignola is probably the, um, the Bible for American architects to, if you wanted to create or design a classical column or entablature or any classical order, that is a very easy guidebook to understand because of course it's written in feet and inches and in a coherent <clears throat> language. Um, again, it's not based on observation, it's based on drawings, measurements, and calculation. Now, these three architects, or pretty much most classical architects, they're successful really based because they have an extraordinary ability to draw. So I like to think that designers, artists are very successful by the fact that they can draw very well, <clears throat> and great designers have an ability to draw. So these three, well, actually these all five, Cutter Kim and Michael Dennis, you know, Michael Dennis used to teach at MIT, but for the most part, they really started out being very skilled at drawing. And of course they were marketing themselves and got very well known just by the fact that their, their pedagogy theory and architecture was very successful. Um, so let's kind of take a look at that for a second. So clearly, you know, this building is designed not based by observation and just, you know, Googling an image and turning this into a building. I mean, this person has an ability to draw and understand and see things and draw them. So classical architecture is really generated beginning from accurate measured drawings. This is an Alan Greenberg project. <clears throat> so for the most part, these classical architects really started out doing mostly residential as a rebellion against what's called postmodern architecture. Um, I, <laughs> I mean, these are some images of some very interesting, you know, this, the top image is Charles Moore, and I think he's, we used to practice in Florida, he was a teacher, but for the most part, if you remember postmodern architecture was making fun or puns of classical architecture, it was a very frustrating time, it's really started in the 1960s during the year of tension and architecture and riots and sort of historical events. Of course, the architecture reflected all the tension and ambiguity of that time period. And again, we can see that some of these images are very, these whimsical, somewhat ridiculous sort of versions of what, you know, serious architecture can be. Of course, these are very playful, if not jokes on classical architecture. <clears throat> you can see why the aforementioned architects are, you know, rebelling against this space because they're not taking architectural proportion and skill seriously. And what you're looking at is a mixture of, sorry, a mixture of Michael Graves, Charles Moore, and, some, and probably Robert Venturi, which you've seen probably in your history classes. So the first part I can look at is Alan Greenberg. He's very well-known, very published. 
um, has many architectural monographs on his work alone. It's interesting that this first image really kind of tells the story about what classical architecture originally was supposed to look like. Maybe it was executed, but for the most part, we can see that some of the reconstruction images were polychrome. There's many different colors. Uh, I'm not sure if this actually existed during the, the ancient world, but it is a little bit strange to paint or dye marble and cover up the veining. But, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in this field, but it's interesting to see that this first image shows classical architecture in many different colors. <clears throat> Here's an elevation of a large campus image that I was showing you earlier. For the most part, you know, they really got started doing really extraordinary residential, you know, small to large scale houses. And Alan Greenberg, the facade has many different depths and layers, especially the way the classical ores are very, very carefully done. That the wall thickness has a very ancient thickness classical order to it. You know, when I say th thickness of things, classical architecture has a thickness, of course, because the nature of the walls are actually the load-bearing structural masonry to hold up the floors. I'm sure there's a still frame behind this, but for the most part, you know, Alan Greenberg and these other architects really are replicating the, the proper thickness and dimension of the walls. This is a, a clothing store, Books Brothers. This is just a beautiful building. If you look at the, the three-dimensional view, it's like, you know, classical architecture has a very thick dimension, especially to the walls. Originally, in classical, these would be the structural members for the building. Of course, with steel and concrete, these are very decorative. But look how wonderful the sunlight adds a certain amount of three-dimensional quality to, to, to the walls. He's also very um, well known for his buildings at Rice University, primarily the music building and the humanities building. Well, I think, can you guys make sure you turn your microphones off? Okay, so again, he's really responsible. He's doing a lot of addition to Rice University, the classical campus there in, in, um, in Texas. But, you know, we can see that it's very heavily classical influence on some early models. Here's a wonderful, and this is a, um, a digital rendering of what the space in the music lobby would actually look like. But he's done a beautiful job of kind of matching the materials from Bertram Goodhue's original campus plan, I think in the 1920s or if not before that. But you can see that he's, you know, definitely replicating the same sort of architectural language. And this is just a beautiful collection of buildings that have kind of enhanced the campus experience. Also, he does something very whimsical. This is a reconstruction of Mount Vernon as kind of a playhouse. I'm not sure what this is, but you can definitely see this is a direct copy of uh, Mount Vernon just in a very small sky. I just thought this was such a cute picture of seeing, you know, it looks like it was originally the Mount Vernon building, but of course it's something just a small scale playhouse, but beautifully reconstructed the same classical orders, the thickness are employed here. Now, again, um, there is probably a still frame behind this. I'm sure there's fireproofing, but of course we can see the scale and the detail of the classical language very beautifully reconstructed in each one of his projects. Okay, then we're gonna to shift to Robert Stern, very well known, Robert Ames Stern, based in New York City. Um, there's a really kind of a whimsical carving of Robert Stern holding drawings and blueprints. He's very, you know, he's always wearing his glasses when he's working or being featured on the photograph. But, you know, again, he's very well known for his small scale, if not large scale residential project, the Shingle Style, which is really originated um, probably on the East Coast, Connecticut, mostly based on McKinney and White's Shingle Style cottages or large scale houses. But he does a beautiful job kind of reconstructing the classical shingle style language and architecture. You know, of course, clearly his plans are classical. You know, not everything in architecture is symmetrical. There's an asymmetrical floor plan, but of course it's classical because the thick walls are showing the load bearing masonry walls. I'm sure there probably is a still frame behind some of these walls, but for the most part, 
they are thick and convincing us that the thick walls are the structure of the building. We can see the classical curved exedra in space number six, the bedroom, and of course, many other parts of the house, these wonderful thick walls, which of course are classical and possibly structural for the building. This is actually a Kiamid White shingle saw cottage probably in the early 1900s. You can see that Robert Stern's language kind of borrows from some of McKim White's earlier shingle saw cottages. Um, you can see this is another kind of variation in stucco. We can see like the roof is flying with these really beautiful kind of exaggerated brackets. Um, then he does some really interesting things with um, original classical architecture. If, you, if you've seen, this is a wonderful house in Colorado. I'm sorry, the slide is not that clear, but he's kind of borrowing, if not literally, from an earlier Edwin Lutchen's house, Tigborn Court in 1899. It's a very similar version of <clears throat> the facade with the three gables and of course the two chimneys which anchor um, and create a motor court and a threshold condition from the street, the courts of the motor court. Now you kind of have to wonder, did the architect really want the house? This is a house in Colorado finished in, I think about 2019. You know, it's, you have to kind of wonder, just did the architect want this house to look just like the legend house or did the client's mandate that the architect build it to resemble this house. It's kind of a double-edged sword, but still Robert Stern does a beautiful job of, you know, rebuilding this house in kind of a modern classical language. Um, throughout the lecture, there's roughly about three projects in my hometown, Dallas, Texas. Um, Robert Stern did an extraordinary, it's called the Baron Estate. This is, I think it's probably about 50 or 60,000 square feet, but it's a beautiful classical language of mostly red bricks and the beige stone and metal windows. But we can see how beautiful the language of the classical architecture is here in a large estate. Um, of course, here is a very classical oriented floor plan. We can see that pretty much each room is very contained by the thick mass of the walls. There's a certain amount, there's a certain central axis that the wings spring off of. Then um, when we get to some larger public buildings, the Bush Library is a very kind of simple classical, it's still a classical building because of course we're building with load bearing stone and masonry in a post, I'm sorry, in a, um, a trabeated system, of course, the post and lintel type of construction, which is emphatically classical. But his larger buildings have the same sort of texture of the brick masonry and of course the um, the stone classical language. <clears throat> um, it's a very somewhat austere version of classical architecture. Normally, a true classicist would, you know, reconstruct the classical orders, Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian, and apply them to, the, to these facades. It, this is actually at the um, SMU campus there in University Park City in, in close to Dallas. But for the most part, he admits the decorative elements and just leaves the, um, the simple post and lintel type of construction expressed in the facade. It's interesting that he kind of leaves off the decorative orders and just lets the mass of the building, of course the openings and the architecture read simply without being adorned with the classical language. Here's an interior shot of the main multi-volume entry condition here. So when he does much taller building, he kind of, he kind of leaves out Again, reconstructing the classical orders. If you look at this, you know, these I think were built in the last 10 to 15 years, but he's leaving off the classical orders, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, and Composite for a sort of a more streamlined Art Deco style. It's interesting what he does with early sort of modern architecture in a classical. And of course, it's classical because we can see that the punched openings are looking, resembling like they are the structure of the building. In other words, there's still a sort of frame. This, but for the most part, the stone and masonry is thick enough to where it looks like it is the structure of the building. It's a wonderful roof open landscape in the top of this building in New York. <clears throat> but normally, you know, true classical architects would reconstruct or build the classical orders that we've seen throughout, you know, the, in the ancient world. It's interesting, he kind of leaves those off and makes the building kind of an early modern architecture aesthetic. Especially, it's a wonderful contrast to see the kind of Gothic brick masonry on the right here. And then of course his, um, his sort of mid-century early Art Deco 20s skyscraper in New York. 
what I was saying is, you know, this of course is a neoclassical building built in probably the late 1800s, if not the early 1900s, this is the municipal building in New York by McKim Mean White. We can see that they literally built the classical orders as a mixture of Ionic and Corinthian orders. But again, when Robert Stern does tall buildings, he leaves that off as kind of a way of making the classical language more, I guess, I hate to say the word updated, but a more kind of streamlined classical language. And again, here are some of Stern's other projects. We can see that the base is rusticated, very classical. We can see that the structure of the arch is clearly structurally represented on the facade. These diagonal wedge shapes, which are called voussoirs, the opening clearly shows that is the structure of the building. Of course, now it's probably stone veneer faced over steel and concrete due to International Building Code structural um, regulations. But we can still see there's a beautiful language of attempting to look like a true masonry load-bearing wall. Now, again, this is just a very brief overview of all these art. This is a very short chapter in their work. They have hundreds of projects, probably some of the most prolific classical architecture practicing today. I just was gonna feature five or six different buildings, um, but we're gonna next talk about Quinlan Terry. I'm sure you've probably seen him. Um, you have to, um, in the world of architectural design, really have to understand his name and where he comes from. His, um, Quinlan Terry is the owner and the father of <clears throat> the architecture practice of course, his son, Here's Quinlan Terry, the father, and his son, Francis Terry, is a very accomplished and very talented architect. Of course, they both have won multiple awards for architecture and, and in drawing. Of course, they've done publications and books. Um, what's interesting on this facade in the book is like Quinlan Terry has a wonderful sort of poetic language and a nice sense of humor to, to actually construct the, the wicker baskets around the columnar capitals there. And he, again, I was saying he's actively the principal architect for the royal family. So he's very successful, very well known, very established. Um, of course, he's really, if you look at most of his work, this is, I don't want to say modern, it's, con it's considered new classical architecture. Um, because, you know, when one phase of architecture dies out, we kind of always go back to the classical language, which is important. But his early houses are clearly, you know, very heavily based on Palladi is probably four books. And I'm not doing Quinlan Terry's architecture justice just by these first 10 or 15 slides, but he does extraordinary work with the classical language primarily based on Palladio's architecture. It's interesting that Quinlan Terry is actually using Baroque sort of sensibilities in this curvilinear facade. It's nice to see him kind of, you know, break away from strict classism into something more Baroque. Of course, these, you know, could be you know, considered Palladian bills, but they're actually, these are, I think were built in the last, last 15 or 20 years. You know, then we have, of course, we have this incredible estate in Holland Park, Texas. Um, you know, this is just probably one of the better, if not the best classical houses in Dallas. Um, he's clearly following the architectural language, the rules, the canon, the proportions in Palladian, the Palladian books, the four books, the Quattro Libri very, very carefully done, studied, and applied as kind of a new recent classical architecture. Now, of course, Palladio's dad, we wouldn't be using steel, concrete, and air conditioning systems, but it's nice to see that Mr. Terry or Sir Quinlan Terry is actually, you know, using the classical orders in exactly the proper way it's supposed to be proportioned. Of course, we see the Surlian arch in the end pavilions. The pavilions are the ones on the left and the right. And of course, the proper ratio of the openings to the windows and of course the wall maps around that. There's some other projects I'm showing the, the, in the lecture later that kind of violate the proper width of opening versus the wall. But of course, Quillen Terry is um, a Palladian file and follows his um, architecture pedagogy very seriously. We have this extraordinary house <clears throat> there on Preston Road in Holland Park, which is a beautiful testament to Palladianism and to classical architecture on its own right. Again, you know, what I'm saying is the classical architects, they really do architecture with much larb and urban skill. This is the entire Thames Bank development, Richmond Riverside there in London. Surprisingly, all these buildings are recent construction. This looks exactly like what you would see in the London streets in between 1600 and 1800. 
a very strict classical language, if not neoclassical. Um, but of course, that's a perfect architectural typology for the city of London. And of course, London has a really wonderful eclectic mix of modern high-tech steel and glass with Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, but Quinlan Terry has kind of reconstructed this embankment to kind of match the other London architecture. It's very beautifully well done. We can see that the windows are deeply in the center of the wall to, of course, to convince us that it is a true load-bearing stone and masonry wall, which actually there is, of course, a steel or concrete frame behind that. But this is just a beautiful collection and re recreation of the classical orders, especially the depth of the walls. Because a lot of times when classical architects don't really understand that classical walls are bearing the weight of the buildings, that the walls look very thin, but Quinlan Terry has managed to design a very beautiful kind of thick wall condition where the windows are very deeply in the wall as the original kind of language of London architecture was at the time. I'm sorry, some of these slides are not that clear as I would have hoped they would be. But again, you can see Quinlan Terry carefully reconstructs the proper orders, probably based off of Palladian's four books. It could have been Vignola, it could have been Raphael, but he's very serious about reconstructing the proper orders that were established in the ancient world. It's good that we still have a classical architecture that classical architect that is properly reconstructing the orders. You know, we can see this is a Greek temple front originally based on an ancient Greek temple, beautifully reconstructed by um, Quinlan Terry. There's a beautiful curved um, outdoor space. We're gonna be getting into Michael Dennis. He really was actually born and started when I, in my hometown, Sherman, Texas, where I grew up, he was a very well-known designer that, that moved out of, of course, Sherman to Dallas and then of course to Boston. But he really responsible for doing much larger campus plans. This is Michael Dennis and associate. Associate, you can see that he's still doing the classical language in kind of what's called a larger urban scale. He does mostly large campus plans. And of course they're classical because we see an emphatic symmetry, a center line where the large rectilinear buildings define a courtyard space and relate to the context. A lot of architects now into the Kajuri world violate the context. They don't care about centers and organization. They just are doing digital kind of video game architecture, which is really cool. But Michael Dennis is very respectful to the existing context, of course, in a nice formal language. There's a beautiful building. Of course, it is classical because it is symmetrical based about a central axis. We can see the punched openings celebrate the thickness of the wall because of course it's supposed to be load bearing of the floors and the buildings behind that. These are just a few of his projects. He's really, I mean, there, he has hundreds of wonderful projects. I just was giving kind of a, a base, a beginning of about three or four projects that he's done, but his work is really wonderfully executed. The same thing with Cotter and Kim, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they do the same thing that Michael Dennis is they do larger campus plans. These are some buildings around, a lot. I, I think this might've been buildings around the MIT campus, I'm not sure, but you can see that the classical language is very clearly and carefully articulated with, with of course, modern inflections, the large glass wall, the brick masonry, the symmetry. And these are just beautiful classical walls, of course, with mo I'm saying modern inflections that the classical architecture is, of course, a load bearing masonry, the bricks that are expressed in the facade. Then we have these interesting early kind of industrial traditional glass walls. So we're not literally creating the classical orders. So Michael Dennis and Connor and Kim is leaving out the decorative order for the simplicity of the wall plane. Then I'm gonna feature, um, this is a, a local project. Of course, I'm based in Dallas. The old Parkland Hospital, I'm sure you've probably seen this in many publications. This, these editions have won many awards. Uh, Trammell Core, of course, is the very well-known multimillionaire, if not billionaire developer, developer Good Fulton and Feral Architects really 
the ones that were responsible for doing this beautiful collection of classical buildings. This is the entry portico to the other sections, which of course have been added by Good Fulton and Farrell. I just thought this was a really wonderful sculpture, I think featuring Don, the beginning, and of course the sculpture superimposed in front of these beautiful Corinthian columns. So what we have here is an enormous kind of reconstruction of the ancient pantheon in Rome, of course, rebuilt by University of Virginia or originator Professor Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but in this case, the rotunda is treated very differently in multiple levels. It's interesting that instead of a large staircase base, which normally classical temples originate from, is that there's a second base of office space that is underneath the rotunda. Normally, this sits on a large plinth. But they've elevated this. This is actually, let me go back to this one. This actually follows the angularity of the streets, 35 and Oak Lawn. Um, this is a really wonderful kind of vista to see when driving from downtown. And you can see the return at the very apex of the intersection, the two streets. This is just an enormous collection of the buildings originated from the main. I'll kind of show you. This is what the original Parkland Hospital was constructed as a hospital in 1913. Then of course it was condemned and was gonna be demolished and Tremco bought the building and, and created most of these for his offices for his corporation. But we, what we see is a very carefully articulated reconstruction of mostly the classical orders, primarily based on the ancient, of course, Roman temple, the Pantheon in of course, Rome, Italy. What's different about this one is, um, is that the, Normally what would be a round open central volume of space is kind of the first three or four floors are all office spaces. Then of course the top is the rotunda space. But normally in classical or Renaissance architecture, this would be one large open space. We've seen the main volume of space at the University of Virginia where Thomas Jefferson makes us a large reading or library. They've done something very different. But this, this entire complex has nothing but these enormous um, office spaces and library but very carefully done. And you can see that the architects reference the classical proper way to proportion the classical order. This is definitely not based on observation what other buildings they've looked at and what appears to look pretty. They're based and carefully drawn by early calculation measurements and scale drawings, which an architect should refer to. Sorry, this rendering is somewhat blurry, but we can see it's clearly um, based off of either Thomas Jefferson's Rotunda in University of Virginia or the ancient Pantheon of Rome. This is the upper story right underneath the cylindrical dome. It's a wonderful meeting space. So we pretty much can see all the classical orders. They're you know, clearly referencing probably the lawn at University of Virginia. We see Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composites. But look how large the cornice is for a large scale building, wraps the entire building around and actually engages both the front portico, portico from the main quarter and of course, the one that faces the intersection of the two streets. These are some interesting little detail shots. Some of these are a mixture of the old Ionic order from the original 1913 building, some additions, the condition of the old Parkland Hospital before the reconstruction. The, the central image, which I'm highlighting with my cursor, shows the original front facade. And of course, the modern, there's only a small fraction where Gilt Fulton and Farrell added a modern addition of the back, but then for the most part, Trammell Crow, I think, used the classical orders as the other additions. So the mixture of modern and neoclassical architecture in these. So what I do now is I'm just gonna end the lecture with what's called a literature drive. We're still in the, the chapter called Literature and Theory of Classical Architecture. We really haven't, we've seen some of these drawings, but really these are very widely published, extraordinary engravings and drawings that most classical architects refer to. Um, Pyrenees, I'm sure you've seen these. Lettre and of course his name is pronounced Choisy, Augusta Choisy. These are mostly drawings and engravings of classical architecture in Rome. Um, I didn't want to end the, the series of lectures on literature without showing these projects. Of course, there are tons 
of publication to reconstruction drawings. These are three really extraordinary talents and drawings which have fascinated and romanticized the language of classical architecture. So we can clearly see, um, you know, this is a, a self-portrait of Piranesi as an engraving. His work is just absolutely some of the most intense architectural drawings you've probably seen. Um, what he does is he, does, he has a famous publication of Views of Rome. And that's exactly what this is. These are clearly fantastic reconstruction. Oh, I'm sorry. Renderings of, of course, the ancient pantheon in Rome, many other views of Rome, the Trevi Fountain. You know, you have to wonder are these, some of these are single handedly done by the artist himself? But uh, I think for the most part, he did have many assistants and apprentices to be able to finish and draw these. Now, originally, these were drawn by hand and transferred to a metal engraving. So that way we have, of course, an early form of reproduction without, you know, we didn't have printers back then. So these were done originally by hand and then of course on paper and then transferred with his apprentices in an engraving on a metal plate to have reproduction edition prints. But the intensity in the chiaroscuro is really extraordinary. In these. Then of course, Piranesi did thousands of drawings. There's books on just decorative elements. Um, he's pretty much drawn all the classical orders in a very elaborate language. <clears throat> Most of these are based on ancient Roman buildings or Greek buildings. And interestingly enough, um, Robert Adams and James Adams were practicing architecture at the same sort of time frame that um, Robert Adams was working at the time. So when you look at some Robert Adams renderings, they're pro probably for the most part done by Piranesi. So if you look at some of the beautiful engravings he did, these are primarily done probably by Pyrenees, it's an interesting sort of dialogue. The same thing that a lot of architecture firms, you know, contract out architecture firms and, and designers to draw the renderings for them. So, you know, this is definitely not a new thing in architecture to hire people to do, you know, presentation drawings. He was responsible for doing a lot of Robert Adams <clears throat> renderings. So we probably haven't really, this, this person is not that famous and very well known for doing these incredible, what's called axonometric drawings. Augustus Choisy. Now his drawings are not, you know, Piranesi's drawings are perspectival. If you see now, Augustus Schwazzi's drawings are more analytical and axonometric. So if you look at his drawings, they're not just pretty drawings and postcard pictures, they are very explanatory about the skill and the true nature of construction. Now this image is showing a, a I'm sorry, a class or an ancient Roman vault with um, concrete being poured between the, the brick with swaths. So we, Augusto Schwazi is showing you construction techniques. These are just really wonderful explanatory drawings about the structure of things. We can see the way that the brick vaulting and the masonry arches are done as structural members. Wow, extraordinary drawing for one person to even do this. We've seen I think this is a section of Basilica Maxentius in Rome. We can see the, the way that the bricks are treated with concrete and of course the way the coffers are drawn. I'm not sure this image shows the base. But what Choisy is showing you is the construction technique of the ancient Greek temples. You can see the post and lintel. The lintel or the header is drawn independently of the course the metope and the triglyphs and the frieze. Again, some wonderful axonometrics looking up at the ceiling, the way traditional or classical arches are supposed to be constructed. So in this drawing, we can see the construction techniques of the Pantheon's dome before the, of course, the coffers were added later. And of course, our final one is Paul Littrow. We, I'm sure you've probably seen his drawings of Edifices of Modern, Modern Rome, a very popular book. Um, but his drawings are just expert. There is a mixture of sections and perspectival, <clears throat> excuse me, images. So when you look at original drawings or reconstructed drawings of ancient Rome, they're probably featured in Littrow's books. Um, these are extraordinary perspectival drawings. It's really wonderful to see. I'm not sure which building this one is. You can see there's a 
through the dome of St. Peter's by Michelangelo, but his line work is just extraordinary. It's kind of a simpler line weight drawing of because Piranesi really intensifies the shadows, but later he likes to emphasize just the pure line quality. So there's really nothing shade, there's no shade or shadows. It's really just the pure line drawing. And he did an entire book on just pretty much all the buildings in the Vatican, beautifully drawn. Yeah, look at the line, look at the way the Corinthian capitals are drawn. There are, these are also a little bit deceiving because the people are shown much smaller and Le Trui's drawings are engraved. So if you look at people, is that they kind of exaggerate this. So I, I think this hopefully was intentionally done, but when you go there, the spaces are not quite as large as you see in the book. So it's interesting because I brought a book when I went to Rome of Le Trui's engravings and all the people were drawn smaller than they actually existed in the scale. So it kind of, kind of distorts the scale in these images. He does extraordinary sections of all the domes. This is St. Peter's by Michelangelo. There's an incredible image of one of the corner piers in St. Peter's, of course, with the structural drawings and parts of the dome. And a lot of the buildings that we've seen in class so far this entire semester are drawn in several later weeks books. Of course, this is the Tempiota by Bramante. These are some facade studies. These, and I'm gonna end the lecture with, um, in June, I'm gonna be recreating or restarting the drawing classes. These are some examples that my students did last summer. And we do, we start off doing orthogonal. If you look at the list of drawings, part of it is um, orthographic projection. The other part is pers perspective drawings. We're gonna be mixing the two. These are some wonderful sketches that my students did that I've really never drawn before. Um, we just do elevation studies with shades and shadows, how they can be quickly and easily sketched and just some basic understanding of perspective drawings. So let me go back up to the first slide. And we have a couple questions whenever you are ready for those, Jay. Yeah, let me just scroll up. I, I'm, used, I'm not used to using this platform. I'm trying to go to the first one without Oh, here we go. Yeah, I just wanted to end the lecture with kind of the beginning is that I think by now you've under, you can understand that a lot of the classical orders or classical architecture is really based, not built and designed by observation, they're built and designed based on early sort of in drawings you can measure, sort of create yourself. You know, because I you know live in Dallas and parts of the, um, the neighborhoods around North Dallas and Frisco and Plano, you know, they really don't understand or don't really know how to properly design. Some of them do, but there's a lot of really disturbing looking buildings. If you don't really understand the language or don't take it upon yourself to draw these, then of course you're gonna be designing some sort of very bizarre looking classical buildings. So yeah, and so Valerie, I think you had some questions. Yes, what do you think of Craig Hamilton's new office building and bell tower for the old Parkland campus? Oh, you know, which which campus is that one? I'm trying to remember. It's not it's not the one in is it the one in Austin? We're at the old Parkland campus. Oh, uh, well let me go back. Um you're, so there you're talking about a specific building that's here. Uh, it said what do you what do you think of Craig Hamilton's new office building and bell tower? Oh, I, I don't have an image of, I think that's really incredible. Also, I think, is he the one that, what they did was they reconstructed what's called the Temple of the Winds. And they did, yeah, they did a beautiful, I don't have an image of it, but I think that's just extraordinary. The scale and the details, yeah. Pretty much all of these buildings are very, very carefully done, especially at a large scale, a classical language, yes. Mm -hmm. What you see in the, the lecture, wondering what, what I think about design work. <laughs> but I know I think those are all really beautifully, 
very carefully thought out classical buildings, yes. What I was going to show you, it's, it's interesting. If you look at the central image, the one that has that kind of diaphanous screen, they started off doing some of the additions modern, but then they changed and went back to <clears throat> the classical language, which of course was originally the language of, of course, the old Parkland Hospital in 1913 and 14. And I think Valerie, we, you have some other questions as well. Now there was just a comment about the Muse House. Oh, it's yes, uh -huh. actually not veneered. It is built with solid stone masonry that are 18 inches thick. Wow. You know, I was a little bit hesitant about presenting this because, you know, I didn't know if the owner was there in the picture or not, but let me get back to that one. Yeah, um, no, you're right. That That is, I, I've seen some cross sections and some details to where the masonry is <clears throat> load bearing. But I think there are some parts where there is steel. I think for the larger smiths, I might be wrong about that. But yeah, that's just an extraordinary. We're lucky to have something like this in Dallas. Mm -hmm. What I was saying is, you know what, you know, Terry, Quinlan Terry did is that what I'm saying is the proper spacing or ratio of the windows opening to the wall. When we get down to here, I think in a larger building in Parkland, it seems like the wall mass is not quite wide enough to support to really make this a load burning wall because there definitely is a still frame behind that. If you look at the rotunda by Thomas Jefferson, the wall mass between the ones is much wider because of course that is the true load burning masonry. There's not steel behind that. So probably I, I'm guessing they could have made the windows smaller, made the brick mass of the building much wider to make it look more convincing like a load burning masonry wall, but it's still a beautiful building without doing that. It's and then very, the other, yeah. Oh, sorry. The other comment was Greenberg's music building at Rice didn't turn out very nice. <laughs> um, well, now let me go back to, because I think I'm showing you renderings. It's, let me go back to Greenberg. I, I've never been there. This is, of course, a digital rendering. It's a little bit, I think it's a little bit strange that we're using, you know, Romanesque Gothic arches. It's just kind of a strange mixture of Romanesque details and classical architectures. I think it's that that's that's kind of what you're hinting at. Is, is that kind of what I don't know who asked me that, but it's just a strange mixture of Romanesque windows in a in a Renaissance classical building, but then it's not really Renaissance. It's some, look it's, it's Gothic looking somewhat, but then we don't have pointed arches. It is a very unusual looking building, and I've actually never been there in person, but. I think these are much stronger classical buildings than kind of what I was showing you here earlier. I thought this was such a hoot, is to kind of rebuild Mount Vernon as a playhouse. You know, just, I just like the scale of that. And I think we have about 10 more minutes. Um, we had a couple more uh, okay. comments. Hill said that it's the context of the historic Rice campus. And then Tim said the mix style fits in at Rice, but the execution and massing was poor. Oh, wow. That's interesting. You know, I, I've been to, I've had been to Rice in a long time, but I, I don't think I really remember visiting these buildings. But yeah, it's, you know, the design and the execution are obviously two different things. If they're not really built well, then it just kind of diminishes its architectural integrity. Now, these are, of course, are not constructed. These are definitely renderings. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. These look like very exciting buildings, but they're not really executed well. Then, of course, you know, it's kind of a major disadvantage. And then, Valor, you said there's some other comments. That was all for now. Do okay. you guys have any other questions? You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask anything you guys want.
But other than that, I can just give a reminder that we're going on a slight little break before the next class. So the next classes won't start up again until June 1st. Um, we did that based on a lot of the client schedules. So we're giving you guys some time who are in the industry to wrap up any of those projects before your clients leave for the summer. So our drawing classes will start taking place again June 1st. And those are actually going to be two hours long. So if you can make it for a portion of that, you're welcome to join. We'll have everything recorded and online. Um, other than that, I think that's all my my little updates, Jay. So I'll let you wrap up. Well, yeah, everyone, thanks for participating. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I know you think you've, I've got over a lot of information over the last several months. I'm sure you have a much better idea of understanding classical architecture, especially in-person observations, knowing how to see things. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone in the drawing classes starting in June. And Valerie, thanks for inviting me to teach. I really appreciate it. It's a very distinguished honor. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you for doing this. This has been lovely. You're we'll welcome. see you guys soon. Okay. All right. Have a good summer.